So about 45 minutes ago, let's say 300 miles away from where we're sitting, an emergency meeting from the ECB as the periphery spread blows out. You've been in the room, rooms like this before. What must that be like? How difficult is it for central banks right now? Well, it's, uh, I, I, I'm going to say it's an extraordinary meeting as opposed to emergency meeting. As a central banker, you always try and calibrate these things. Uh, look, it's a, it's, uh, it's a very unusual situation. In the meetings that I was in, um, we needed stimulus and, and we needed to support uh, market functioning uh, in an environment of really negative shocks. The main shock now is that central banks are withdrawing stimulus or prospectively withdrawing st stimulus. And so it's an unusual situation to be taking away with one hand, prospectively in the case of the ECB, but looking at how you can support mar market functioning give with the other hand. And so uh, they really have a, uh, a fine line to uh, walk. Right. Here. It is this issue of can the ECB stand still just do 25 basis points when you have the Fed going ahead with 75 in a jumbo hike? Yeah, well, look, different economies, different inflation dynamics. Uh, the ECB, rightly in my judgment, uh, has now pulled forward tightening, ending uh, quantitative easing, uh, you know, being pretty clear that they're on a path to tightening. Um, but they have this issue in terms of... Uh, the integrity of the euro, uh, peripheral spreads, making sure there, there should be some widening of spreads, just to be clear, uh, in a tightening but environment. But too much? It well, makes sense I to mean, do that. Well, that's the judgment they have to make. And I think more about the market functioning and ensuring, you know, this is a monetary institution, and what they want to ensure is that monetary policy transmission is working and they're not getting outsized impacts uh, because of spread widening in the periphery uh, relative to the core tightening of policy that's needed for the euro area as a whole. Well, of course, it's not just Europe that's had this market reaction. The U.S., this momentous reaction with 75 basis points getting baked into the decision today. Do central bankers, does the Fed, do they need to shock the markets with these type of huge moves? Well, I think what uh, central bankers, and uh, let's assume the Fed does 75 basis points, we'll find out in a few hours. Uh, I think what's clear is central bankers need to catch up to their economies. Uh, they've, you know, they've been behind the curves, they've acknowledged this, um, and they need to start to get interest rates uh, above uh, inflation uh, effectively, or at least perspective inflation, inflation expectations. So right now, as you know, you reported last Friday, uh, inflation expectations in the U.S., at least under consumer expectations, 3.3 percent. So you're not going to start to bring inflation down if uh, your policy rate is materially below that. They need to start moving more rapidly. Does it make sense to front end, front load those? Well, it, uh, to the extent you can, uh, it does make sense. If you're far behind, it does make sense to front load, just like the converse was. Uh, we front loaded some pretty big cuts when there was uh, sharp shocks. I think what is as important, though, if I may, Danny, uh, today is not, uh, obviously it matters whether it's 75 basis points. But what really matters, to me at least, is what is the committee saying about the future path of rates? Uh, is there potentially, you know, are we getting to three and a quarter, three and a half by the end of this year? Pardon me? Do you think they'll go to 4 percent, market pricing uh, that in for 2023? Look, I think ultimately perhaps being in that range of 4 percent will be necessary. Remember, they also have some quantitative tightening as well. Two other things, though, I would look for. One is... Where do they think the longer-term interest rates are going to be, the so-called equilibrium rate? Back in March, they, the average was 2.5%. My personal view, that's no longer realistic, given the shifts in the global economy. Uh, that should be higher. And then as well, very importantly, again in March, it didn't feel credible that inflation could come down without unemployment moving up uh, from these very tight levels. At, at that time, though, people who held that opinion said because the Fed is behind, once they have to do what they're doing now, they're going to front load, therefore they're going to break something. Does it feel like we're getting to that point where something might break? Well, I, I would distinguish in the economy, um, look, we had this huge shock of COVID. We had a lot of people who couldn't work for 18 months, 24 months. Uh, we had an acceleration of the digital transformation. We've had, an, you know, a lot of other shifts in the global economy. So not surprisingly, the equilibrium rate, I'm talking like a central banker because yeah. I was one, you know, the level of unemployment uh, in the economy that's consistent with price stability has gone up in the U.S. Now, I don't know precisely where it's gone, but it's probably four and a quarter, four and a half percent. And the Fed had been acting as if it was still like it was 
before COVID, before all these shocks happened, that wasn't fully credible. Right. And so I wouldn't call that breaking something. It's moving the economy back to where it needs to be. That's not a great thing to happen, yes. but, uh, obviously, for the people who become unemployed, well, but it's at, a necessary thing to happen. You look at the BOE as well, your former colleagues there, the market pricing them in 2% for next year. Is it the same? Can they get to that level and the UK court economy still support it? Well, the UK economy has had uh, the shocks that the US economy has had, the German economy for that matter, you know, the COVID-related shocks, the global shocks. It also has uh, the impact of Brexit acting at the same time which is another supply shock, at least over the monetary policy horizon. So there's a less of a reserve army of labor. There's a bigger restructuring going on within the economy. Both of those add to inflationary pressures in the UK economy, even though it has slowed quite dramatically. So, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge for uh, the MPC. I have full confidence that they will get it right. Yeah, but now you get to just be an observer rather than feeling Very the trauma so. yourself. Well, speaking of which, Mark, I, I of course can't let you go without asking uh, about your your job currently yes, at Brookfield, the transition job. fund. How much, though, is that, is investing in a world that moves to net zero, how much is that complicated by the fact that there's a war going on where we're trying to plug that hole left by Russia and, in some ways, moving to dirtier fuel sources right now? Well, um, we're sitting here in Berlin, um, and let's look what the Germans have done, the Europeans have done three-and-a-half time increase in clean power this decade, that's clear. Uh, they've accelerated the approval process from six years to one year uh, for clean energy, four times the rate on hydrogen. All those decisions have come in over the course of the last, uh, the last two months, uh, and Germany targeting 100 uh, percent clean power by 2035. So because of the war, they're accelerating the net zero transition. That's not, you know, that's the bigger picture. Um, and we're seeing similar things in other jurisdictions. That is not to diminish, though, the very near-term pain and scramble for hydrocarbons in the short term.